Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the City Council's Committee on Health. I want to inform the public that there's an overflow room available in the members' lounge. Don't miss your chance to get a seat. We don't want you to be left out of the building. Uh, I am very happy to be joined, not only by um, our wonderful colleague and member of the Health Committee, Councilmember Alika Amprey Samuel, but a brand new addition to the City Council's Committee on Health, Councilmember Bob Holden. Welcome. You're off to a great start uh, on punctuality. <laughs> okay, and welcome, Dr. Kunis. Uh, Kunins. All right. Today we will be hearing Resolution 221, uh, which I am pleased to be the prime sponsor of, which calls on State of New York to expand the existing medical marijuana program. We will also be hearing Resolution 765, sponsored by our colleague, Carlina, Councilmember Carlina Rivera, which calls on the state to pass legislation to ensure there is a mechanism in place to rectify any conflicts between the state's medical marijuana regulations and future recreational marijuana regulations. This is a time of truly dizzying change in marijuana policy across the United States with dozens of states moving rapidly away from outright prohibition towards some measure of legalization. New York is no exception. In 2014, the Compassionate Care Act established a medical marijuana program in our state, and now leaders in Albany are poised to go even further legalizing adult use of marijuana with establishment of a regime for taxing and regulating this substance. Okay. I and most of my colleagues strongly support the move towards full legalization, in part to rectify the profound racial inequities in the ways that our existing marijuana, marijuana laws have been enforced, an injustice which has had dire life consequences for generations of young people of color in this state. But even when New York succeeds in legalizing recreational use, it is critical that our state's medical marijuana program not just endure, but that it be strengthened and expanded. There are many compelling reasons for this. Those patients who are seeking use of medical marijuana for treatment of health conditions should be able to do so under the guidance of a medical professional. They should have access to medical grade marijuana where the quality and dosage is strictly determined according to their needs as a patient. It is important that we eventually have insurance coverage for medical marijuana. Uh, we do not at the moment, but we believe that the um, retention and strengthening of the medical marijuana system is critical to eventually achieving that important goal of uh, health insurance coverage. It is critical that ongoing clinical trials help us further understand those conditions for which uh, marijuana does indeed provide uh, demonstrable relief for patients. Um, and we think that um, to have continued to classify this uh, as a tool in medical care uh, is critical to the ongoing support of that kind of critical research. Um, this is true whether or not we succeed in the goal of legalizing adult use recreational marijuana. And uh, this is the theme of today's hearing, um, the goal behind our resolutions, and will certainly be the subject of our discussion and, and uh, testimony uh, from the administration. And so with that, I, I want to acknowledge we've also been joined 
by uh, stalwart Health Committee member Keith Powers, who was extremely disappointed that not one but two members beat him into the committee today. Um, <laughs> we, are, <laughs> we are up in the bar as we speak. Um, it's always a good sign when you have more people on the dais than you do in the chambers. Uh, usually it's the other way around. Um, and, and on that note, um, Dr. Kunins, uh, I'm going to cue it to you, and I'm going to ask uh, our committee counsel uh, to please administer the affirmation. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Levine, members of the Health Committee. Uh, my name is Dr. Hillary Cunnins, and I am the Acting Executive Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Mental Hygiene at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. On behalf of Health Commissioner Barbeau, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify on medical and adult use cannabis legalization. Uh, it is crucial that we maintain a strong public health approach to cannabis legalization as debates move forward here and in Albany, and I very much appreciate your time and support for these issues. I should also just add, as a, an internal medicine physician and addiction medicine physician, these issues are ones that I have long been thinking about, both in my work at the health department as well as in my clinical practice uh, uh, for more than a decade in the Bronx. A public health approach to cannabis legalization must not overlook that cannabis use is associated with some health risks. While many people report feeling euphoric or experiencing relaxing effects from cannabis, we know that some people may experience harmful effects. Studies show that regular or heavy use or use during adolescence can lead to addiction in some cases. Additionally, smoking cannabis is associated with conditions like asthma and bronchitis, but I should note that there's no evidence to date that smoking cannabis increases an individual's risk of what are typically tobacco-related cancers like lung and throat cancers. Importantly, also some people experience cognitive impairment while using cannabis and for a short time after, but typically these effects are temporary, what people commonly describe as a feeling of being high. This can affect a person's ability to drive safely, and in some rare cases, people may experience temporary psychotic-like symptoms like hallucinations or delusions. Whether or not cannabis use increases a person's risk of developing a chronic mental health disorder still remains uncertain in the scientific literature. Much remains unknown about the health effects of cannabis use because research has been hampered in large part because of its federal classification as a Schedule I drug by the DEA. This scheduling imposes significant barriers for researchers to both obtain product for research as well as funding. Cannabis should be rescheduled at the federal level to allow for robust research on the health effects of cannabis as well as the potential benefits of cannabis for medical purposes. These potential risks around health issues underscore the city's commitment to ensuring that cannabis use is only accessible to adults, those 21 years and older. Equally important to address, as the chair, as Chair Levine already pointed out, is that the prohibition of cannabis has caused great health and social harms, overwhelmingly to black and Latino individuals and communities. So cannabis legalization must also address the harms of criminalization and prohibition that so many New Yorkers live with every day, as well as simultaneously reducing the potential health harms of cannabis use that I just described. For example, we know that criminalization itself is linked to a range of adverse health and social outcomes at both the individual and community levels. For example, having a drug record can limit access to public benefits, housing assistance, employment, college aid could lead to family separation or deportation. So we must also acknowledge that long-term effects of criminalization on individuals and communities as we consider cannabis legalization. Now let me turn to the city's efforts in regard to the legal cannabis debate. Last July, the mayor convened the Mayor's Task Force on Cannabis Legalization to identify the goals and challenges that should guide the city's preparation for potential legalization by the state. The Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice coordinated this task force 
and included representatives of relevant city agencies, including us at the Health Department. There were five subcommittees <coughs> on the task force, licensing and land use, economic opportunity, taxation and finance, law enforcement and social justice, and public health, social services, and education. The subcommittees met regularly to develop the recommendations reflected in the final report. We consulted with community groups, subject matter experts, and studied jurisdictions that had legalized and regulated the adult use of cannabis. Last December, the task force published its final report, which called for a strong public health-focused regulatory framework and the empowerment of local government to prevent large corporate dominance, to foster small businesses, and meet the demands of diverse New York City communities. The report placed great emphasis on the need to ensure that any cannabis industry in New York State redresses the impact of past criminalization and drives economic opportunity to historically marginalized communities. The task force ultimately developed a vi viable roadmap for legalization in New York City. We took lessons learned from other jurisdictions, adapted best practices to meet the needs of our unique city. Building the regulatory structure for legalized cannabis should be an, a long-term dialogue and partnership between city and state health, safety, economic, and community actors at all levels. We look forward to ensuring that the policies that emerge from this process are consistent with the city's commitment to health equity and to protect the health, safety, and economic well-being of all New Yorkers. Of course, much of the future of cannabis legalization and the way it takes shape in New York lies in the hands of the state and the legislation currently under debate in Albany. I want to briefly go on to summarize our public health priorities and goals related to cannabis legalization and encourage the council to review, if you've not already, the task force report for greater detail and information. We hope the state legislation will allow the city to pursue these priorities. Representatives of the administration are advocating for the city's positions in Albany, and we look forward to any opportunities for our partners in city council to join us in that effort. First, we believe that a legal cannabis framework must allow both state and local government to protect New Yorkers from the adverse consequences. At the same time, new enforcement measures must be carefully tailored to avoid criminalization of the very same communities of color that have already borne the brunt of cannabis criminalization and mass incarceration. Thus, it's critical that legalization in New York should avoid per perpetuating or creating punitive response to cannabis violations. Government should impose civil rather than criminal penalties for violations of cannabis regulations to the greatest extent possible consistent with public safety. The administration believes that the purchase and possession of cannabis should be limited to adults age 21 and over, and that locally regulated consumption sites be established where adults can use cannabis without fear of arrest or public disruption. Promoting public health and safety, impeding the unregulated market, and redressing the harms from the disparate enforcement of cannabis criminalization should all guide these legislative and regulatory solutions. While it is critical that localities have a meaningful role in regulation, there are certain aspects of legalization policy that must be implemented at a statewide level. Any legalization framework must include automatic expungement of all criminal records for past cannabis offenses that would now be legal. This is critical for repairing the harm experienced by individuals who have been disproportionately targeted by cannabis enforcement. Likewise, there must be a full decriminalization of individual cannabis use, possession, and sale to align regulation of this newly legal product with other adult use consumables, such as alcohol and tobacco. In other states, this is important to note, that have only partially decriminalized cannabis, total arrests have indeed decreased, but racial disparities in arrests have persisted and in some cases widened. In addition, cannabis revenue should be directed to muni municipalities and reinvested in communities that have disproportionately borne the negative effects of cannabis prohibition. Second, given that the harms of cannabis consumption are concentrated among younger users, access to cannabis should be limited to adults 21 years and older. It is additionally important that product packaging and labeling do not promote underage use or appeal to children. While this could take many different forms, packaging should not mirror that of candy, and all packaging should clearly label all products, contain cannabis, and detail the risks, potential risks associated with use. 
Third, in order to ensure product safety, the task force recommends a statewide so-called seed-to-sale supply chain tracking system. Tracking cannabis products across the lifestyle from growth to the point of sale will ensure that New Yorkers are obtaining cannabis that is inspected, meets safety standards, while preventing products spill, out, spill over between the legal and illicit markets. Fourth, the diversity of cities and towns throughout New York State demand unique and tailored regulations with regard to sales, consumption sites, and home cultivation. New York City's population density raises particular concerns about the siting of retail outlets and consumption spaces, as well as the safety of home cultivation procedures. As such, the task force has recommended that state cannabis laws and regulations incorporate local control. Finally, the health department's robust sur drug surveillance has played a key role in the city's response to the op current opioid epidemic. Building out this infrastructure to monitor and evaluate the effects of cannabis legalization in advance of and throughout the legalization process will help us fine tune policies and adjust course as necessary to keep New Yorkers he healthy. Briefly, I would like to touch on medical cannabis. Under New York State law, the New York State Department of Health has regulatory control of medical cannabis and localities are preempted from further regulating the program. In recent years, the legislature has added new categories to the list of authorized conditions for which physicians may certify medical cannabis for a patient. For further questions on access to medical cannabis, we encourage the council to contact the State Department of Health. As the legalization discussions move forward, I do want to make one uh, last critical point regarding the medical cannabis industry. From both a public health and racial equity perspective, it is important to keep medical and recreational cannabis businesses separate to avoid vertical integration and dominance by these already established corporations in New York's cannabis interest industry. Existing licensed medical cannabis purveyors should not be granted preferential treatment in recreational cannabis licensing nor should they be allowed to maintain vertical integration of their supply chain if they choose to enter the recreational market. Based on the experiences of other jurisdictions, the task force is concerned about the anticipated negative consequences of vertically integrated businesses, which require large amounts of startup capital and are difficult to operate as small businesses. In particular, we are concerned that such vertically integrated businesses will edge out smaller, local, businesses owned and operated by per persons of, from communities of color and poor communities. Our s efforts to safeguard and improve the health, social, and economic well-being of New Yorkers go hand in hand with addressing structural impediments to our health equity aims. Learning from how we regulate other adult use products such as tobacco and alcohol and examining the best practices and lessons learned from jurisdictions that have already legalized uh, or already have legal cannabis. I want to thank Chairman Levine and the committee members here today for your dedication to this important public health issue in our city. And together, I am confident we will build a framework for cannabis legalization grounded in racial justice, health equity, and public safety. And I'm very happy to take questions. OK. Thank you, Dr. Cunnins, <laughs> for being here. Uh, you're a medical doctor. and. Uh, I know you have focused intensely on the health impact of, of marijuana. Um, do, is it your opinion that science backs up the use of marijuana for treatment of any medical conditions? So I think, um, just re reflecting back on my testimony, I think unfortunately we have inadequate science for a number of conditions that ha show some early promising results, but I would not say they're conclusive. The best evidence that we have for the use of medical cannabis is for certain kinds of painful conditions, neuropathic painful conditions, uh, as well as intense nausea from chemotherapy in, in a cancer setting. There are many other promising uh, studies, and as I indicated in, in my testimony, that the greatest barrier has been the current scheduling of cannabis as a Schedule I substance, which, pr which essentially precludes uh, investigators, potential researchers, from getting funding from the federal government and from obtaining product to study. And this is... Uh, uh, and as well as some of the more downstream effects that I think you mentioned 
uh, Chair Levine about getting insurance coverage and so forth. So this is sort of a fundamental policy change that I think is needed in order to create more opportunities for science. Right. We're in a catch-22 because legal restrictions and other barriers have um, limited the number of, of patients who are using marijuana for medical purposes. So there's not an adequate pool of people to study, and therefore, that's, that's, is, is that an, is that an uh, accurate statement? I think that w with sufficient resources, there would be an adequate pool of people. I mean, this is a little bit also chicken and egg, as you, as you referred to. Uh, but I do think it is ultimately a, a funding and infrastructure issue. Okay, well that, that could be solvable. I mean, the good news is that legalization of recreational marijuana should broaden uh, the pool of potential uh, uh, participants in studies and uh, should ease the, the kind of barriers you were describing for researchers. Um, but the, the conundrum now is that limited research has valid has not validated. It means we don't have a lot of use cases that are validated, which means fewer people are using it, and uh, we have less to work on. So, um, uh, we we but we but we shouldn't rule out the potential for this as a treatment on a wide variety of of, of conditions. Um, you did mention chronic pain and the kind of nausea and discomfort associated with chemotherapy as being, I think, now. Uh, accepted, and you also referred to promising uh, indications of, of useful effects for other conditions that have not yet been perhaps validated uh, as thoroughly as, as they should. Could you mention w what are the promising areas of use? Sure, and, and let me also just add one um, small caveat, which I think it's important from a both public health and medical point of view is uh, for many conditions, there are accepted and highly tested, highly effective treatments, and uh, we, we would not want to see medical cannabis substitute uh, for those other highly effective, heavily studied treatments. So just to also put that out there. But that would be at the discretion of a medical professional, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And ultimately, this is a conversation between a patient and in and, and a certified provider of medical cannabis. Absolutely. Right. This is uh, in best made at, between a doctor uh, and, and their patient. Absolutely. And I think I also want to just say there is no doubt that there are people who are uh, suffering from a number of health conditions for which there are not uh, either uh, other well, highly effective treatments or treatments that have worked for that particular person. And there is no doubt that medical cannabis has been helpful in some of those circumstances. So I think some of the other many, many conditions that are being investigated include all kinds of pain, actually. Um, the one kind that I mentioned is a particular kind of nerve pain, also a spastic pain. Um, so pain is, as everything else is, highly nuanced. And I think we know from the opioid uh, epidemic that pain is can be hard to treat. Our solutions are not always as good as we would like in the medical or public health profession, and medical cannabis represents a new option. Another condition that has gotten a lot of press is for post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, it, which is a condition that really can cause a great deal of suffering and for which treatments are certainly effective, but probably not as effective as we would like. And there is some science, and I'm hopeful there will be more uh, uh, that looks at that condition in particular. The list really goes on, yes. and, and we know, um, and I'm happy to go on, um, uh, but I think for, I'll also point you to a really terrific book that's published by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Math that is a very thick book available free online that goes through uh, in a very rigorous way the levels of evidence for the variety of conditions where there is excellent medium and really no evidence. There are certainly some anecdotal evidence of the success with patients who suffer from migraines, mm -hmm. uh, which I assume you would put into the category of pain, but uh, it seems like that holds a lot of promise. The kind of condition for which um, some patients have found no other 
form of relief. I, I mean, so that's a, that's a great example, I think. Migraines are, can be extremely troubling for people who experience them, and, for, and there are really good treatments for migraine that for probably most patients get very good relief or decrease in frequency, um, but not everybody. And right. so there are examples of conditions for which there are proven treatments for, and, and still don't address everybody's needs. And so these are areas in which we need more science and we need to weigh both the risks and benefits. As a chronic migraine sufferer, this is the topic I care a lot about. Yes. And so uh, uh, I should probably chat with you offline about the science Happy on that. Happy to. Um, even if New York City does, New York State does legalize recreational adult use of marijuana, we still have a very hostile federal environment. There's no chance under the current administration that there's going to be uh, federal legalization. Um, hard to predict what would happen farther in the future. But since so much science is funded by federal government sources, um, how can we ensure that good research can proceed with, with um, such hostility from Washington? Right. So um, just sort of p going back to my earlier point is that this re the rescheduling issue uh, by the DEA does not imply legal – is separate from legalization. And so it is I – I appreciate your point. Um, it is possible that there might be some movement that would still facilitate additional research. What some jurisdictions, although not uh, perhaps imperfect, have done in their state uh, legislation and regulation is to also set up – or um, budget for research funding at the state level. And so that might help to uh, promote additional research as well, both fund and afford access to, to a supply chain of, of product to, to, to study. New York City itself at various points has funded research um, to fill the gaps uh, when there's compelling public health interests at stake. Um, um, you know where I'm heading on that. Yes, I see where you're heading. Uh, that um, I would just say that typically, at least at the health department, we we have not fund uh, funded medication trials typically, um, ran, whether ran, randomized controlled trials or otherwise. But I um, I see your, I see your point in various drafts. And again, I you know this is a conversation with New York State is that there is. In various the bills, there's various iterations. There are provisos for to to make funding available for research. Right. Um, I've made the assertion that made the assertion that even if we do legalize recreational use, there's a compelling case for continuing the medical program. In part because uh, you want medical grade uh, prescriptions available where the quality and dosage is, is, uh, is, is very strictly determined. Uh, for example, in some, some cases, a doctor might prescribe um, a form that does not have THC. Uh, one example of the ways in which a doctor might want to very finely tune what the patient is, is uh, ingesting. Um, I think it's critical that eventually the health insurance system cover this. It should be considered no different than uh, any other medication if it's prescribed by a health professional. Um, can you comment on, on the validity of this argument that we need to, to continue and strengthen the medical program uh, even if we do legalize uh, recreational use? Um, so um, what I, what I will share with you is um, in other jurisdictions that have legalized adult use cannabis um, that they that there have been efforts to continue the medical cannabis program and that some, the procedures for operating those programs remain somewhat different and I concur with you that having a medical cannabis program allows for the kind of patient doctor patient healthcare provider relationship that allows for uh, conversations about the role of cannabis in treating a medical condition. I also agree with you that in that setting, the health provider can um, uh, adjust dose and 
approach different combinations of, of THC and, and, and other substances that could address the person's condition. So I think there's absolutely a role. I think that um, in terms of strengthening is really a conversation with New York State about sort of current use of the program and capacity and so forth. And we, we don't have all those data to really make an assessment about what is, if current capacity or how to strengthen it uh, uh, strategically. There are some uh, conditions which, uh, for which medical marijuana shows some promise that are not currently allowed under the state's uh, Compassionate Care Act. It's uh, including Alzheimer's, muscular dystrophy, dystonia, rheumatoid arthritis. Would you support expanding the current law to cover those conditions? Um, you know, I think I'd have to, for, so again, it's uh, the threshold for those determinations are at the state level. I think my general approach would be uh, to review the science uh, and, and create a standard threshold for inclusion or not inclusion of new conditions. And I think that's part of how they are running the program and thinking about that quite critically. Okay, now I'm going to pass off uh, to our newest member of the committee for his debut questioning. No pressure, Councilmember Holden. I have to make this good because you've been promote, promoting. I don't know. If I'm ready for this. We'll see. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, the administration is had set 21 as the age, um, and it's and it just that seems to be arbitrary. You think or um, uh, but, but, you know, I, there's a lot of feelings in different uh, sections. Certainly in my district, I would say more people would be against um, legalizing marijuana. I don't know about medical. Uh, I've spoken to a number of people who are, you know, from other states that are on medical marijuana, and they, they feel much better. So it's, uh, I just, just think in testimonials, um, we're hearing benefits and obviously the science. Um, as for consumption sites, that red flagged me right away. Uh, in my neighborhood, let's say, or my districts, people would be against having consumption sites because of obvious reason, public safety, um, just, um, it, it, you know, almost like it's becoming another bar. And how do we enforce, how do we even test for somebody driving impaired? I, I still haven't heard a real, other than a blood test, is there anything um, that the police could do on the scene to determine if somebody's under the influence mm -hmm. and driving? That was a lot of questions. <laughs> um, so I just, just broadly, before jumping into some of the specifics, I think, um, you know, I, I think our, we really want to convey that we, as this moves forward, we should do this carefully. I just right. want to say that. Um, yeah. And, um, I think there is evidence from other jurisdictions where there have been um, uh, errors uh, because things either happened uh, without enough experience, which I think we're now in the position to learn as a state, as a city, from other jurisdictions, so I will say that. Um, in terms of age, I think that um, uh, it is, 21 is not entirely arbitrary. I think what we know is the brain and, and attendant risks of brain development not going well is continuous actually into one's mid-20s, but it's not like now you're developing and now you've stopped. It's, it's a continuous right. uh, thing. So that the age is consistent with other adult use products, now in New York City tobacco and alcohol nationally. Uh, and so it's consistent with other social policy uh, and, and, and makes sense both developmentally as well as pragmatically. Uh, in terms of um, consumption sites, you raise a really important issue, which is that because of the federal laws that, that you, you're aware of um, and, and individual uh, buildings' choice of, of not having smoking, uh, in their air. This is a way to afford people the option of consuming, including by smoking, without being in public. So we very much see this as addressing, one, safety, 
to keeping public use out of the public and not unintentionally exposing young young people to to to, to cannabis use. Uh, and three, as an equity issue, because people, particularly in public housing, will not be able to use cannabis legally on in their houses. So it makes sense, we think, from a public health and equity point of view. And we also think there should be. Um, we recommend in the task force that these issues be left to the localities to make recommendations about whether they exist. Yeah, I, I didn't think about the public housing aspect. Um, it says no smoke. It, it says no smoking in public housing. Does it say cigarettes or doesn't? Doesn't doesn't. I, I will double check, but does not specify. Because so, if we, so we cannabis could, we could smoking exempt, would, if if it if it doesn't do the harm that cigarettes actually cause, then maybe we could exempt smoking marijuana. I just feel. Um, this is opening up a can of worms on consumption sites because knowing my district, people would be upset if one opened up next to them or near them. It's attracting a lot of people and they're coming out stoned and um, cre creating a, um, a public safety issue. So um, I would tend to just say if we're going to legalize it, um, just you know, do, do it in your own home or, you know, your own backyard or whatever, you know, away from the public and you, and prohibit public smoking, period. And just to go off slowly. Also, there's a question, and this is one thing that I don't know the administration has thought about, it, advertising. Um, has, can, you, can you mention? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, um, so um, as we discuss in the task force report, we know uh, from both the tobacco world and from the alcohol world that advertising and increased intensity of advertising increases in particular use, use of those substances. So we make recommendations about limiting advertising uh, and limiting marketing packaging to avoid both appeal to youth and overall exposure to messages about use. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Councilmember Holden. I'd say you had an outstanding debut there. <laughs> and now we're going to pass it on to a committee veteran. And that would be Councilmember Keith Powers. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that. I'm going to actually pick up from where Councilmember Holden left off. Um, in terms of regulating it, even in the city standpoint, and we're talking about locations and proximity and things like that, the, the the state alcohol beverage control law has a number of provisions in it around uh, proximity to schools and religious institutions, proximity to other other establishments that are of a similar type. I'm wondering if the city has considered anything, whether that would be a uh, an example of how to cite either consumption sites or or sales places for sales. Um, so a absolutely, this was part of our review with other jurisdictions and, and our uh, recommendations for best practices is that siting of both retail or potential consumption sites should consider uh, the, the factors that you mentioned as well as other ones. Bigger picture that I just want to make sure the committee is aware of is in the case of alcohol, the city is pre essentially preempted, prevented mm -hmm. from controlling siting of both on-premise and off-premise sales of alcohol, meaning both uh, wine, liquor stores, as well as bars. Um, and an important recommendation that uh, the administration put in our task force report, and we're currently advocating in, in with New York State elected officials is to include local control in whatever bill, whatever piece of legislation that gets passed, so that we as a locality with all of our specific needs, diversity of communities, density of all of our um, uh, retail and, and other kinds of uh, er environment can be considered by the municipality. So. I think then 
the specifics of what makes sense for our city can be worked out in some of the ways that you are already Got uh, it. pointing out. Great, thank you. And the and the Clean Indoor Act um, that was that has been gradually passed over the years. I think starting in the Giuliani era. I think um, has some institutions that are grandfathered from that because they they existed at the time of the law passing. Would those be grandfathered for smoking marijuana as well? Um, I'd, ha I'd have to get back to you on that, okay. um, about the way this would play out okay. exactly. Got it. Because those would be consumption sites, I guess, in its own sense in that regard. Um, on the, um, one of the recommendations, one of the requirements, even though we're preempted, the state law for the ABC law also requires community board approval for site location. Is that something the city is uh, pursuing or supporting? Um, so my understanding of the ABC law is it's community board input. It's advisory. Yeah. Correct. Is that something that you're seeking here as well? So we have much more general recommendations around local control more broadly than is present in the ABC laws. So I would say that that is, um, uh, we had uh, stronger recommendations okay. about local input okay. than, than community board uh, uh, advisory role. Got it, okay, great. I think I have two more questions. One is, um, there's a separation also, I'm just, I'm just gonna continue on that line of thinking because we have at least some example of a regulated industry in the, in the, um, in the uh, liquor world, that ABC law also separates the out, the three tiers, meaning if you distribute it, you can't sell it, um, so forth. So if you manufacture it, you can't be in two tiers, basically, you have to be in one. Do you know if that's given any thought here as well? And, and, the, and, the, and the purpose being that you want, it's basically to restrict monopolies, or it would be in this case like, um, like Guinness opening up a bar and having direct to, direct to uh, uh, sale, you know, being able to sell directly to themselves. Do you know if there's any considerations about the tiers here as well? Or, or an opinion, I, I should say, also from the administration on that. Right. I mean, I, I think that the the the, deep, the um, I appreciate your referring to the alcohol laws. My my understanding is that those are date from prohibition yes. and was a, a strategy to pre to prevent. Uh, uh, crime and corruption. Yeah. Um, so in this case, the again, in, as we recommend, is we want to make sure that there are opportunities for small business and economic opportunity, in particular for com for people living in communities that were historically uh, um, experienced too many harms from criminalization of cannabis use, or individuals who perhaps were in the illicit market that are looking now to be participate in the legal market. And so by avoiding uh, r the requirement of vertical integration uh, will allow for more small businesses to enter the market. So in this sense, it's not exactly a tiered system mm -hmm. that we're recommending exactly in the same way, but we're recommending multiple different kinds of licenses, some of which can be uh, accessible to smaller business people. Okay, great. My last question is, and this came up to me through a constituent the other day, and I wanted to, I wanted to maybe ask a similar question, which is, we, we've been talking so much, even in this chamber and recently with the Department of Health around the harm of smoking and smoking cigarettes and tobacco and the chemicals that go into them, and sort of conversely having a conversation around legalizing it in another area. And I'm wondering if, if you can speak to that a bit. Uh, I think that, um, I think that at the state level, and I'm not sure if this is this is fact, that it doesn't permit smoking. It permits non-smoking. Uh, you know, the, you can eat it. You can there's oils and things like that, but it doesn't actually permit smoking. And and you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But I'm wondering if that's been discussed at all, and and your thoughts on it, because not only the fear that you would you would end up in a world where additives would be put in to make it more addicted, second to the idea that you, you, know, you might be encouraging smoking, period, at a time where we are trying to discourage it uh, uh, and, and lower it and regulating it, and how we sort of, you know, how we sort of have that, those two discussions at the same time and weigh those two things out. Uh, so I think you're asking all these are all really important questions, um, and I think some of which we know and some of which we don't. Let me just, just to clarify from, uh, for information about the, the sta this state's medical cannabis program is it does not allow for smoking of the, the plant product. 
Um, it, you can consume it in uh, the oil or the extract in a number of different fashions, including um, oral, orally eating it, um, though not as an edible in baked into a, another product or something like that. You uh, can vape it. Um, so the decision, again, this is a state program, was to limit the forms. I think, uh, I, don't, I don't know, but uh, to sort of uh, to try to reduce any inadvertent health harms. What we know about cannabis smoking and, uh, and, uh, is that, as I mentioned in the testimony, it is associated with some lung symptoms, bronchitis, asthma symptoms, but does not seem to be associated with increasing lung cancer or other cancer risk, which is obviously very important tobacco smoke. I think we need to have very, uh, I, I appreciate your concerns, and are we gonna inadvertently message that smoking is okay if people, if we're permitting through adult use cannabis, adult use smoking? Um, I think that's why public health messaging is extremely important. I think there are some examples from other states that have legalized, I'll cite Colorado in particular, which has, uh, really terrific, fact-based, very clear messaging. I think, as you know, the health department really uh, has messaged about all kinds of things, and this would be some of the issues you raise we would feel very important to get out for the reasons that you say. It, I, and I just add on a comment, which is I, I am, that's, that's the one concern I have here is that we are messaging con, uh, across, you know, cross messaging here, and that also by commercializing it, we, we do open up the door for folks to try to um, uh, add, put additives or other things into it to, to make it um, uh, uh, more attractive or more addictive for folks, and that we not only have to message, but we, may, we, we really have to potentially regulate that up front. Uh, absolutely, and I'll just add, in the task force report, we do comment on prohibiting, should legalization, adult use cannabis legalization happen, prohibit uh, mixing with flavors or other uh, products to make it more appealing for the reasons that you just mentioned. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I realize, uh, Dr. Connors, that, that disease control is not under your portfolio, but I couldn't let a health committee hearing go by on this morning of all mornings without commenting on the ongoing crisis that is our measles epidemic at last count approaching 300 cases, four to five new cases a day, the vast majority are children. This is a crisis almost entirely driven by parents who are refusing to vaccinate their children. They're buying into conspiracy theories, bogus, bogus claims, uh, made by medical professionals who have been entirely discredited by the mainstream medical and scientific community. Um, the MMR vaccine, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine is safe, period. It is safe. This has now been confirmed by studies uh, uh, again, 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 and again. Uh, most recently, a study in Europe with over 600,000 participants that showed absolutely no link to autism. This is not a gray area, scientifically speaking. Um, and this disease can be fatal. Uh, in the current outbreak in New York City, thank goodness, uh, we have not had a fatality, but we have had um, uh, many children have wound up hospitalized, including in the pediatric ICU. Uh, and this is a highly, highly communicable disease. It doesn't even require physical contact. It doesn't even require you being uh, in the same room at the same time. One person who's affected can leave the room and uh, another person could be contaminated by walking into that room as much as two hours later. Uh, this is a, uh, the, the classic public health challenge where Parents who are making irresponsible decisions for their own children are endangering other children. Uh, this is precisely uh, the scenario that's playing out in New York City. And I want to offer strong support for the health commissioner's actions yesterday, for your boss's actions yesterday, in declaring a public health emergency and mandating vaccines, no exceptions other than 
extremely rare cases of medical uh, need, mandating vaccines in the uh, effective zip codes uh, in Brooklyn uh, with, with actual penalties for those who don't comply. Um, the, the seriousness of this cannot be understated. We have not invoked these emergency powers, as far as I'm aware, for about 100 years when we had a smallpox uh, breakout raging in the city. Um, these, I, I know this was a move that was not made lightly, uh, but I strongly believe it was warranted. Um, and finally, I want to address the fact that this is a, a, a crisis uh, almost entirely contained within uh, the Orthodox Jewish communities uh, of Brooklyn and elsewhere, but primarily in New York City, it's Williamsburg and Borough Park. There have been multiple senior, prominent, respected rabbinical authorities who have offered unambiguous, not just opinions, but directives, directives to all families, Jewish families, uh, to provide this medical benefit for their children. Uh, and uh, that also needs to be disseminated. Uh, these are authorities in New York City and authorities in, in, in Israel, uh, senior rabbinic leaders, respected scholars who are weighing in on this. Uh, and community leaders uh, of, of no less uh, esteem than Rabbi David Niederman uh, of the United Jewish Organizations of Williamsburg uh, who have weighed in with quite strong words on this. This is, remains an ongoing crisis. And with the approach of Pesach, um, where families and communities are gonna be coming together, I fear that, um, that we have not seen the end of this. And so I, I strongly support the efforts of the health department uh, to aggressively move to protect every child. And, and my message continues to be to every New York City family, to every New York City family, get the MMR vaccine, get it now. If you don't know where to go, call 311. They will direct you to free and low cost options, including the health department's vaccination center uh, in Fort Greene, which is very close to the affected areas. That, was, that wasn't a question, but you, you can feel question, free to, to weigh in. That wasn't a question, but thank you for your support, and we will absolutely convey uh, your words to the health commissioner. Thank okay. you. Okay, please do. Um, we are uh, currently considering uh, the city's approach to CBD, which is a component of cannabis, which is a non-hallucinogenic substance. Uh, I want to emphasize that consumption of CBD does not make you high. Um, but uh, it, this is another area where uh, science is um, still catching up. This is a subset of the challenges we have in scientific assessment of the, of the health effects of marijuana more broadly. Um, we're probably even farther behind when it comes to assessing the effects of CBD. Um, at a moment when we are moving to legalizing recreational marijuana, we already have medical marijuana legalized, and you offered a pretty robust case for that in your opening remarks and your answer since. Um, you offered a, a very strong, I think, medical, ethical, uh, and perhaps even moral case when it comes to some of the uh, failures in enforcement for legalizing. Um, uh, you, you might forgive a New Yorker who sees a contradiction in the health department's move to ban the sale of CBD uh, in teas and other uh, foods and drinks in New York City. Uh, could you explain that contradiction, please? Yes, well, I, I appreciate that you point out the science is lagging with CBD. I just will add um, to the background is there was just a recent uh, study that shows that products labeled as containing, food products labeled as containing CBD were found to have, uh, con contain CBD in different amounts, quite drastically, 
and with other additives like lead, though they were labeled just as CBD. This was just in the Journal of American Medical Association, and this product testing showed that almost three quarters of products contain different things and in different amounts than what was labeled. So there's, um, the FDA regulates this uh, and is also looking at this as a food safety issue, and that was the backdrop in the health department's uh, regulatory approach. I think, as you know, a different part of the health department, um, and I'm happy to, we'll be happy to connect you with them to sort of discuss further the enforcement approach going forward. I'm not here to weigh in on the science behind CBD, although my understanding is there's increasing evidence that at least for some conditions, including, I believe, people with seizure conditions. That, that's right. Um, and, and much like uh, uh, marijuana more broadly, there may be others that are waiting to be studied. There are certainly anecdotal evidence of benefits. I don't confuse that with scientific research, but this is a time where society is questioning the wisdom of prohibition for a variety of substances. And uh, I think the consensus that has emerged is that there's a real downside to prohibition and that um, a proper response is tight regulation and uh, robust education of the public to the public, ongoing research, et cetera. And uh, I think any fair person would see CBD as, uh, even based on what we already know, as being less worrisome from a health perspective than tobacco, for example, uh, which, which is legal. Um, so my position is that a drastic move to outlaw the sale of CBD in New York City is not yet warranted, that it is um, in contradiction with the broader movement uh, around marijuana and our ongoing stances towards substances like tobacco and alcohol. We need to study it. Uh, sure, we need to label it accurately, and it's unacceptable that there be ingredients uh, inc uh, included in some of these oils which are not disclosed, which may be harmful. Uh, but to me, an outright ban um, is, is not the best policy at this moment. Uh, with the, there's an economic impact to that. Many businesses are, are relying on this. Uh, there's a CBD pop-up store right here on Broadway, uh, footsteps away. And there are New Yorkers who have, who have experienced the benefit, again, not yet validated by science, perhaps, um, but they're consuming it for some reason. Thank you. You referenced in your opening statement the mayor's task force on cannabis legalization. And um, I'm, I am glad that you are convening what I assume is, a, is a, an array of experts to uh, examine the uh, the implications of legalization, the possible benefits, and how we can be sure that as a city we manage this in the interest of health and safety and other concerns. Um, to what extent has that task force asked questions about medical use, and uh, could it be in some way enlarged to do that, or perhaps do we need a second task force which while perhaps not conducting its own clinical trials, could gather the best evidence uh, from around the world, could look at what other jurisdictions have learned, and if nothing else, make sure our city is prepared uh, to have the best policy response for medical usage. Um, ju just to clarify, our, our, um, the task force met, uh, issued in a report, and, though, um, and there's no ongoing charge at this point. Did you catch that? Um, just we we Forget met. Me, yes. We issued a report. It's not uh, an ongoing task force. Ah, okay. It seems like there's some unfinished work related to medical usage. Um, I'd like to chat with you about either. Is that task force under your your department, your your so uh, division? Um, so I was the lead for the subcommittee on on public health, uh, social service, and education. The overall task force. Uh, was coordinated by Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, and I would, um, and they they served as the lead and the coordinating body, and right. I would 
uh, I'm sure they'll be happy to talk to well, you. Well, may maybe we just need to reconstitute your subcommittee with, with this expanded charge. Uh, we can talk more about that, but it does seem like there's un unfinished work there. Um, forgive me for not having acknowledged, she's been here for a very long time, but I did not acknowledge the arrival of our f fellow member, uh, Councilman Rebaron. Um, I have one more question and I'll pass to you if you have any, but okay. Um, do you fear or foresee any potential conflict between the legal regimes around uh, legalized adult recreational use and the ongoing regime of medical use? You know, I, I, uh, again, I would really defer that question ultimately to the state whose, whose regulations will guide both the medical cannabis and the adult use cannabis worlds. I think the details are not, um, you know, we don't, there's not a bill yet, and so I'm, uh, um, certainly details will need to be worked out. In other states, referring to sort of research that we did on the task force, certainly they, uh, other states and jurisdictions were able to come up with regulatory systems which were not in conflict. I appreciate that. I mean, one possible conflict would be in pricing. And if it's cheaper to get pot from your local dispensary than it is to get prescription grade cannabis, then people might be diverted away from controlled dosage and as, as you described, um, uh, very clear uh, uh, formulations related to the specific condition being prescribed for. So one of many potential conflicts we need to be aware of, if health insurance begins to cover medical marijuana, then we solve that problem presumably. Um, I, I, I do want to just close by saying that, uh, as I've said in multiple hearings, I consider us to have the best big city public health department in the world, and I think that this department should have a role in, in, uh, in uh, shaping the future of marijuana use in the city uh, broadly and specifically for medical purposes, uh, understanding that we're under state jurisdiction here. Uh, that's the way it works in this country, but uh, I do think that this health department um, does have a role, uh, if nothing else, um, in applying uh, its expertise uh, to this complicated and still developing issue. Okay, thank you, doctor, and we're gonna pass on to our next panel. Thanks very much. Okay, my pleasure. Did, did you have another follow-up? Okay, could you hold on for one second? We have a new committee member who likes to have second round questions, and we are going to allow Councilmember Holden to do Thank that. Thank you for encouraging that. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to echo the Chair's um, concern about the CBD. Um, we have um, some businesses in my district that are concerned. Um, one um, feels that they've been descended upon by city agencies after the health department came in, um, buildings, um, and other, um, other agencies came in that they feel harassed at this point. Now, I, ha I did have CBD coffee, and it calmed me, not like regular coffee, so I thought it was okay. I did see the report. Did you bring enough to share? <laughs> no. <laughs> I did see the report, I think that you saw, that there are some products that have lead in it, and it's very harmful, obviously, and, and the claims that it's 10% uh, CBD or 20% it wasn't accurate, but you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater by just banning CBD. I think we have to go after the products that are not accurate or just that falsely advertise um, an amount. So I think we need, you're right though, we need to study it more, but I think outright ban, um, I, I don't agree with. Thank you very much, and thank you again, uh, Commissioner. We have a panel now. Um, we're going to ask Diana King from the Drug Policy Alliance to please join us. If there's anyone else uh, amongst uh, the many members of the public who have joined us who would like to testify, we'll ask that you fill out a slip. Um, and um, we're going to pass it off to you. Uh, if you can make sure the red light is on. There you go. 
right, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, council. Thank you for convening this hearing. I'm happy to speak to such a diverse audience today. Um, I just want to briefly touch on the work that we're doing uh, with the Sensible uh, Marijuana uh, Coalition that we're working on and the MRTA and the ways in which we're trying to make sure that the legal industry doesn't conflict uh, with the medical industry, but want to acknowledge the fact that the medical industry does have a, a need for some deep reform in order to prevent some of the things that she spoke about, like people from who would benefit from uh, physician care and guidance going to the legal market to secure product because it's gonna be potentially uh, more affordable in that space. So, the Drug Policy Alliance appreciates the opportunity to submit testimony to the New York City Council's Committee on Health. The Drug Policy Alliance is the nation's leading organization working to advance policies and attitudes to best reduce the harm of both drug use and drug prohibition and to promote the sovereignty of individuals over their minds and body. The Drug Policy Alliance and the statewide Start Smart campaign, uh, the Sensible Marijuana Access Through Regulated Trade Coalition, support the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act because it will remove a tool that has been used to harm communities by effectively ending the ineffective racially biased and unjust enforcement of marijuana prohibition in New York and create a new, well-regulated and inclusive marijuana industry that is rooted in racial and economic justice. Ending marijuana prohibition and taxing and regulating marijuana for adult use in New York is smart for our communities, for racial justice, and for our state's economy. The Drug Policy Alliance organized in support of New York's Compassionate Care Act, uh, and we are disappointed with the implementation of the medical program. It did not set out to advance policy that would create a restrictive medical marijuana industry. The limitations of the medical program and the continued criminalization of New Yorkers force us to reassess our advocacy goals, and we recognize that to end criminalization and promote equitable access, New York had to end marijuana prohibition. The work to advance policy that creates an equitable regulated marijuana industry is separate from our effort to reform New York's medical program. Post-legalization, patients will still require medical guidance as it relates to medicinal marijuana use. We recognize that healthcare providers are best positioned to assess patients and administer appropriate doses. We also recognize the impracticality of the medical program and can predict that patients will bypass the onerous medical regulations and secure products on the legal market once it becomes established. If this is an area of concern for the state, then the correct course of action is to significantly reform the medical marijuana program. The, Mar the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act supported by the Drug Policy Alliance is in no way meant to interfere with the state's medical marijuana program. And DPA recognizes that patients prescribed marijuana under the care of licensed physicians will continue to require physician guidance in order to effectively administer the medication. However, there are a number of flaws within the state's current medical program that need to be corrected so that the recreational use and medical use can remain distinctive categories. New York's medical marijuana regulations are among the most restrictive in the country. A slate of regulations introduced after the Compassionate Care Act was signed severely constrained the program and patients who would benefit from the program were either geographically isolated from the few available dispensaries, allowed to administer the product, or could not afford the marijuana at a regulated dispensary. The New York State Department of Health released a two-year report evaluating the implementation of the medical marijuana program and found that patients purchased medicinal marijuana products at a licensed dispensary at a single visit and return visits were minimal. Product cost, efficacy, and distance to the dispensing facility were listed as deterrents to repeat visits. In order to remedy some of the programmatic inefficiencies, the Department of Health offered a slate of recommendations to improve the program. The restrictiveness of the medical marijuana landscape has raised concerns regarding the potential for medical patients to rely on rec recreational marijuana to self-medicate. In order to avoid this unintended consequence, it is important to loosen the medical marijuana regulations to improve patient access. The New York State Legislature continues to introduce bills to reform the Com Compassionate Care Act, and Assemblymember Gottfried and Senator Savito introduced legislation that will expand the list of conditions that can be treated with medical marijuana and grant more discretion to health care providers. If passed, patients with illnesses not included in the program requirements can enroll in the state's medical program. There's also legislation that will allow medical marijuana to be smoked instead of restricted to oils, tinctures, and other non-combustible forms of ingestion. If passed, this will significantly reduce the cost of products and benefit patients who do not get the medicinal effects from non-flora products. 
through the efforts of patients and caregivers, there are numerous corrective bills up for consideration to, and the legislator, and none of them interfere with the legislative effort to create a recreational market. DPA supports these measures, but we believe that it's unwise for the council to ask the legislator to pass legislation that will rectify conflict between the state's medical program and the potential re recreational market nor do we support further studies that could potentially slow down or otherwise derail the movement to legalize marijuana. The stigma which led to prohibition has integrated into New York's attempt at a medical program, negatively impacting many of the patients who help organize for the Compassion and Care Act. It is unrealistic to think that medical patients won't turn to the recreational market if and when it becomes available if there aren't significant program improvements. They are acting in their best interests. In the interim, uh, drug law enforcement continues to disproportionately impact black and Latinx New Yorkers who were targeted for arrests. The failures of the medical program should not delay the end of the prohibition policy. Thank you for those excellent remarks and for uh, DPA's role in um, creating the medical marijuana program in New York State, uh, which has already helped uh, many thousands of patients. And uh, I share your priorities in improving the program. Uh, you identified the need to expand the number of, of diseases or conditions mm -hmm. which can be covered. Uh, I think you, you identified expanding the geograph geographic reach uh, by adding additional dispensaries in underserved areas. Uh, you identified the need to allow for uh, smoking as a form of, of consumption. And I think you might have mentioned this, but um, some of the other methods are more expensive. Yes. Uh, yeah, so the, the vaporizers, the tinctures, uh, beyond being expensive, it might not be the best means for people to ingest the So there might even medicine. be a medical case for smoking in addition to it being more affordable. Yes, right. yes. Absolutely true. And, and you also identified, uh, I think, the risk of uh, once, if we do legalize recreational uh, marijuana, that people would be diverted out of the medical system. Yeah, uh, from our reports on states that have legalized, looking at California and um, Colorado as a case study, uh, California, I think, has handled it the best in that they had a strongly regulated medical industry and applied some of the same taxation to the medical industry as the regulated industry. So it did create two separate markets. So people who were in the medical program were still going through that route. I think the challenge of New York is our medical program hasn't been enhanced uh, to, to address this issue. And just from personal experience in going to Colorado, um, it is much cheaper on in that area. And I don't see why patients would not uh, subvert some of the, the the barriers and restrictions that exist in the medical program to seek medications or what they believe to be medicinal um, in a more or less unrestricted area. The ultimate solution there is for health insurance companies to I, start covering, no? So I thought about that, and there is legislation that would do that, um, but the insurance program is onerous in and of itself, and I'm imagining what people will have to do as far as prior authorization is concerned, how that will affect cost, uh, potentially and delay actually access to care. We deal with that a lot uh, with opioid uh, medications, uh, buprenorphine primarily. Um, what the doctor recommends uh, then has to go through the insurance agency and get approval, and I can see that happening similarly uh, with medicinal marijuana. So yes, it could potentially impact cost, um, but it could also put, you know, create new regulations that come up as more barriers as far as getting permission from the insurance companies to get these medications. Uh, but do you, you share my assertion that even in a world of recreational legalization, we need to retain a strong medical program? Yes, if, if, if you are um, using um, marijuana for medicinal effects, and from what I've heard anecdotally, people who are using it medicinally aren't using it for the euphoric properties of uh, THC. So it would be suitable to go through a physician to figure out what the correct dosage is for you so you're not uh, necessarily having those unintended consequences of now being high when you were just seeking pain relief. Um, so having that, that doctor-patient relationship, training more doctors to administer the drug, I think that's also really critical. I think there's legislation that supports that as well. I think doctors, um, like D uh, Dr. Kunis said, um, with the lack of research, doctors aren't s equipped 
uh, to prescribe this effectively. So there's a lot of things that need to happen concurrently to make sure that uh, the medicinal industry and the recreational industry are both used for those particular purposes. Um, while we finish uh, with your testimony, I just want to call an additional person who's asked to testify. Uh, Robert uh, Potter, excuse me, no, forgive me, Noah Potter, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Dion. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Diana. Diana, thank you. And I'm going to uh, cue my colleague, Councilmember Holden. Do you have questions? Okay, excellent. Um, all right, so Noah, we'll ask you to take it away. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. I just wanted to, uh, to two comments. One uh, goes to the, the medical uh, program, and the other one goes to uh, questioning that was put to the, uh, representative of the representative from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene about on-site consumption. Uh, first, just a, a general comment about the medical program to, um, to emphasize that the, uh, the defects in the, in the program to date were well known uh, for uh, years leading into the enactment. In, uh, the, the program was actually fairly pretty good uh, up until 2014 when the, at the last moment the governor stepped in and really uh, inverted the program. It was, uh, the, the legislation previously had been very, uh, afforded great discretion to medical professionals, uh, did not impose any kind of uh, fixed list of conditions. It granted maximum uh, deference to the physician-patient relationship, uh, as it should, in following the true form of a medical cannabis program that had developed previously. The medical cannabis programs simply followed the idea of a medical necessity for cannabis use uh, and made the statutory the affirmative defense of medical necessity to cannabis uh, prosecutions. And so the, um, what we are experiencing now with the CCA is really a um, uh, total uh, artificially complicated. Uh, there's no inherent complications in the medical cannabis program. Uh, and so at this point, what we're doing is trying to dig out five years after uh, a really over unnecessarily complicated system, um, just as sort of a global perspective. Uh, it didn't, didn't need to turn out this way. It was um, uh, excessive control by the executive, entirely unnecessary. Uh, specifically going to the question, going back earlier to the question about on-site consumption, um, in, in looking at the legislation over several years as it's been uh, consistently introduced each session, both the governor's proposal, the Cannabis Regulation and Taxation Act, and the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act uh, uh, consistently introduced in the legislature, uh, to my reading, are not actually going to permit on-site consumption. The uh, testimony from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, I think, aptly uh, identified the imperative of creating public sites for uh, social consumption. Uh, if that does not, if those are not possible, then the, um, the corrective imperative of the legislation could largely be lost if cannabis consumption in public is still criminalized and there's no public space in which people can consume, then you've missed uh, the, one of the major uh, forces pushing for legalization. However, as I read the Clean Indoor Air Act, it will not be possible for on-site consumption spaces to function. Uh, certainly, they will not permit combustion indoors, and it's very possible that unless the uh, Clean Indoor Air Act, actually, I'm sorry, it's not the Clean Indoor Air Act, it's uh, Public Health Law 1399-AA uh, that defines an electronic cigarette. Unless that section of the statute is amended, it may very well be that indoor vaporization will also be prohibited. So there's some serious attention that needs to be paid to make sure that on-site consumption is possible. The city, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, uh, and well, I should say the mayor, uh, the entire executive branch has taken the position that on-site consumption is necessary and appropriate. Uh, the state legislation contemplates that as well. However, there's a, there's a disconnect in that the, statu the categories, the exceptions under the Clean Indoor Air Act do not match 
the category of a retail licensee for on-site consumption. So until those uh, provisions are reconciled, you could have the possibility that that aspect of the legislation will be dead on arrival. Thank you very much, Councilmember Holden. Okay, excellent. Thank you to this outstanding panel. We appreciate your input. And this will conclude our hearing.